great Caesar's ghost. The Jewels of the Trade podcast. Encouraging professionals with industry inspiration, gemology, and more. Hey, everyone. You're listening to the Jewels of the Trade podcast. I'm Hunter. And I'm Jordan. And today we're talking about turquoise. With an American turquoise miner you may know of from the popular television reality show, Turquoise Fever. Before we get into the interview with Emily Otteson, we want to lay a little bit of groundwork for turquoise. You guys know we love jade. And part of what drew me to jade is its association with Chinese history. Well, turquoise is actually very significant in Chinese history as well. And actually, a lot of civilizations treasured turquoise in ancient times. They have dated turquoise in Egyptian tombs going back about 4,000 years. It was highly valued by the Aztecs. And in the States, we already know that turquoise is very closely associated with Apache culture, the Navajo, and other Native American tribal cultures. One Spanish conquistador observed in the 16th century that the Aztecs valued turquoise more than the Spaniards valued gold. And it was used almost medicinally in the Persian Empire, revered for its alleged ability to cure ailments of the eyes. In the industry, we tend to associate turquoise with Iran because of the term Persian turquoise due to the significance of the mines in that region and archaeological discoveries of turquoise there going possibly as far back as 7000 BC. Extremely fine material has been mined in Iran, but like with a lot of trade terms, Persian turquoise is not always attributed to deserving quality or even material from Persia. Turquoise can range from sky blue or robin egg blue to varying blue and green tones with fascinating spiderweb matrix. Each piece is completely unique and the stone can range drastically in value. Today, Emily Otteson is going to discuss American turquoise and mining secrets from her husband and their family's mines in Nevada. The growing popularity of this material and the effects their television show, Turquoise Fever, has had on their family business. I am here with Emily Otteson, who you may know from the television reality show, Turquoise Fever. And she is an expert on turquoise marketing and sales after marrying into a third generation turquoise mining family. Emily, can you tell our listeners about you and this incredible business that you married into? Yes, it's kind of a crazy story because when I met my husband, he was actually working construction and growing up, turquoise was like, you know, the pale blue sleeping beauty, you know, no character whatsoever to it. And so we were dating and he's like, oh, by the way, on the weekends, I blow stuff up. And I'm like, okay, what does that mean? He's like, I'm a weekend warrior, you know, turquoise miner. That's such a line. That's such a pickup line. <laughs> okay, well, turquoise is ugly. <laughs> oh, you thought turquoise was ugly before you started in the business? I'm like, it's so boring. And he's like, oh, you don't know anything about it. And he started showing me different pieces of turquoise, the webbing and the dark blue. And I'm like, okay, this I can get behind because this is actually pretty. It is. Each piece is so unique. Yeah. And it's so different from what I grew up with, knowing what it was. Because I was born and raised in Arizona, so sleeping beauty is what everybody knew because Arizona and everything. And so he eventually, about two, maybe a year and a half after we were married, he decided to quit his construction job and we were going to mine full time, which is extremely scary from going a paycheck, knowing that you're going to get a paycheck to not knowing when you're going to get paid. Oh, among other concerns, I'm sure. I mean, mining is not exactly for the weak at heart. <laughs> not. <laughs> and you guys are in Nevada, right? And there's there's multiple turquoise mines, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, we own several several mines in Nevada. And I can't even tell you the number of them because there's so many of them. But we only focus on certain ones at a certain time just because it's not feasible for us to be at every single mine and moving equipment is super expensive. So we try to focus on one specific, maybe two specific mines at a time because we've built the business up that we've been able to have equipment placed at different mines. 
every mine can be about an hour from each other. So I feel like anywhere you go out there, it's an hour away, an hour to town, an hour from this mine to this mine, an hour to here. It's when they say it's desolate, it's desolate. Oh my goodness. With driving and travel, I'm sure it's a 25 hour a day, eight day a week kind of job. Oh, yes. (laughs) <laughs> what exactly, what type of work does mining entail specifically? We are open pit. So some people ask us if we mine underground. We don't. I would never, ever approve it just because it scares me to death and it's not necessary. But so we're open pit. And basically, we will come in. If we're starting a new mine, we'll come in and figure out where the turquoise is lying and we will come in with like tipping hammers and kind of start knocking out the ground to try and find the turquoise to figure out where the turquoise is leading to and then we kind of follow it along and then as we start getting into more turquoise we'll bring in the bigger equipment like the excavators so that we can get to the turquoise easier if there's a lot of dead ground around that's when we will blast and basically get rid of what we call dead ground and muck that all out. So you do get to blow stuff up. That's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's my explosive license. What? I say that. <laughs> yeah. You have to have a license in order to handle the explosives. So you can be around them and not have a license. But if you want to be able to handle them and do all that stuff, then you have a license. So my husband, Tony, was like, we're going to get you a license because you're always out there working. And then you can handle the dynamite and stuff. And how many people make up your mining crew? It's usually in the summers. It's just me and my husband, Tony. Oh, my gosh. His brother will come out on the weekends because he does have a full-time job. My husband, Tony, and I is full-time job. So this is what we do for a living. So it's usually just him and I and our kids in the summer. And then my husband will go out once a month for about seven to 10 days. He's currently out mining right now. And it's snowing. Oh, my gosh. So that's always a hard thing. When it's cold, it's hard to mine. When it's snowing, it's almost impossible to mine. Well, and I'm I'm sure it's quite dangerous. Uh, d- does he take anybody with him or does he just have extensive safety protocols in place? Usually he's alone when he mines. Last time he went out, he did have somebody that came out and helped him, which always makes me feel more comfortable. For sure. A lot of our mines, because it is so desolate, there is no cell service. So we've gotten a satellite internet for one of our mines so that we can have service. So if something does happen or go something goes wrong, then he's able to call out because there's a million different things out there that are going to kill you besides, <laughs> you know, besides rocks falling, there's rattlesnakes and, you know, equipment breakdowns. There's just This makes me nervous. (laughs) Yeah, there's a million stories. I'm sure there's a lot of stories that I don't know about. There's stuff that I found out like years after it happened. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, (laughs) you could have died. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Well, he must be a tough man. And you're a tough woman to go out there and do it with him. I mean, it's it's really incredible. You, You guys are like this power couple that is literally digging in the dirt and pulling out turquoise. How big are the boulders usually? It can just depend on what mine we're at. Apache Blue has a lot of huge boulders that we've had to blast from the show. You probably saw that we had to blast a lot of that just because there was a lot of unsafe overhang. And when it gets to that point, like we have no choice but to do that because there has been injuries. Oh, wow. Rocks falling, you know, you just don't know what's going to happen out there. Sometimes the boulders are very large and that's when the big equipment comes in handy because then we're able to move them out of the way. Oh, yeah and make it safer to mine. For sure. I imagine you have to rely a lot on equipment. Yes. It's definitely made our lives a lot easier. It is very expensive to mine. And I think that's one of the things people don't realize is cost of fuel. We don't, we are not close to a town or a city where we are at least an hour away, depending on which mine it is. It could be like an hour and a half away from a city so or a town. So getting different things like water, fuel, food, it all adds up really fast. 
Oh, no kidding. And I guess I didn't realize how far out of town you guys are. And, I, and I'd like to get kind of a feel for the area that you're in. I mean, I know there's so much history surrounding turquoise and turquoise mining, especially in that kind of Nevada, Arizona, Utah, New Mexico area. And turquoise is so significant there, which is interesting. The importance of turquoise kind of goes back thousands of years, at least in China and Egypt. But it, here in the States, I think we really associate turquoise with Native American tribal culture. So give me an idea of kind of where you're located and what kind of cultural connections and history are connected to your turquoise mines where they are in Nevada. So we're located in central Nevada, just outside of Tonopah. So basically, if you were driving from Las Vegas, Nevada to Reno, Nevada, it's literally smack dab in the middle. If you blinked, you would have already driven through Tonopah. <laughs> wow. So <laughs> it's a very, very small town. And then we are at least 60 minutes, 60 miles approximately. Again, depending on what mine we're going to, because we have so many different mines. But Do you sell your material to any of the reservations or tribes in that area? We have a lot of friends that are Native American. Not We do a show in Santa Fe. It's called the Indian Market. And a lot of the artists and Native Americans, they all set up and display their jewelry and everything. And we set up there and sell our cabs and they come in and they buy turquoise from us for their jewelry. So we have a lot of relationships with those Native Americans and they've been buying from us for years and years and years. So we've been able to develop those different relationships with them. I love that. I think that's wonderful. And then tell tell our listeners how you sell your material. Is it rough? Is it cut? Um, most of the time we sell ours, our material cut into cabs. So that would be like the pieces that go into the jewelry. Um, occasionally we do sell it in the turquoise in the rough. Most of the time it's white buffalo that we sell in the rough, which a lot of people call it white turquoise or white buffalo turquoise. And it's actually not a turquoise at all. It's not even related to the turquoise. Is it how light? I've heard it's how light before. It's not how light. It's a dolomite calcite. Interesting. And how light gets passed off as white buffalo a lot. a lot of people either don't know or they are trying to I guess deceive people and let them think that it's white buffalo or they will a lot of times you'll see jewelry that says it's white buffalo but it's really how light so is white buffalo actually more valuable than how light yes Interesting. That is very interesting. We drove through Santa Fe on the way to the Tucson Gem Show a couple of years ago, and we went into so many stores that had what they were calling white buffalo. And I'm not sure if it actually was, but I mean, it's beautiful material. I absolutely love it. My husband loves it. But we, we did notice how popular it was. And so that's that's interesting to know that it's not appropriately called halite. It's actually dolomite and calcite. Is there a noticeable difference to the wearer? White buffalo is usually a white stone with black spider webbing, whereas how white is going to have the grays, gray and white. So that's one way you can kind of tell. Occasionally there might be a gray in the white buffalo, but we don't ever see that. Sometimes there's kind of an ivory look to the white buffalo, which is kind of the lower grade. So we try to mine out the whitest and I guess the best white buffalo that we can. And white buffalo is only found in Nevada. Oh, wow. By the Audisons, which is kind of cool. Oh, you guys, you're the white buffalo people. Yes. <laughs> you're the only white buffalo people. This is an honor. <laughs> so if you go into a store and they have white buffalo and you ask them, hey, where did you get this white buffalo from? A lot of them can say, oh, I got it from the Audisons. Then you know that it's like probably legit. Oh, my gosh. You guys are a really big deal, which, of, of course, I already knew that because of the television <laughs> show. <laughs> yeah. And I, I love I love that you guys have a television show. I love that television audiences are showing more interest in the jewelry industry by supporting shows like Turquoise Fever. How did the show come to be? I mean, did you guys know you wanted to do a TV show? It was a long process. We never really like set out to do a TV show. We've always been contacted by a variety of different production companies. So it took us about, I'm going to say five years, five to seven years. I can't even remember now, but it took us a long time to get to Turquoise Fever. We had a lot of production companies that came out and filmed this and did what's called a sizzle reel, which is 
basically like a trailer for them to take to different networks to sell a show to. And so it took several companies doing that before we sold what is now Turquoise Fever. And the network told us that it's like catching lightning in a bottle. People just think that you can just go and pitch a show and it's super easy and you get on TV and it really isn't. It takes a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of patience. And it's like one in a million people are going to get a TV show. Wow. Well, I hope that it's worth it. I mean, has the television show positively affected your brand or even demand for turquoise in general? We've seen a lot of positivity from it. And a lot of people have mentioned, you know, I didn't know it was that much work to get turquoise. And that's why it's so valuable. And also it's becoming more rare. But it's really pushed our brand out there, especially with White Buffalo. A lot of people didn't even know that it existed before. And so people have like searched us out all over the world. We've had several people ordering from us from France because Turquoise Fever is aired over in France. It's aired in Germany. And I can't remember the other one. It was like kind of a weird country. But they're starting to show it all over the world, which is kind of cool. That's super cool. And then tell me, because I know you guys deal with kind of multiple different things. So you have the white buffalo, which is not turquoise. And then you have a few different types of turquoise, right? We have different mines of turquoise. And then we do have a verisite mine called Poseidon, which isn't related to turquoise. Even though we, we call it kind of like the cousin of turquoise, but it's more greens and stuff like that. Completely different materials. We mine three different kinds of material. and so we've got the white buffalo, the turquoise, and the verisite. And then the turquoise, we've got several mines that we mine. And each mine has a different, distinct look to it. I guess I'm not familiar with verisite. Is it green? It is green. Yeah. Excellent. And then is it is it an aggregate? I cannot remember. <laughs> <laughs> like, what is it? what is it made of? Or like, it must look kind of like turquoise but also must look somewhat different. Does it have matrix or multiple colors? Like, how would you describe it? It does have a lot of matrix to it. Biden has, sometimes it's minty green, like a super pretty minty green. And sometimes it's like a blues and greens together with lots of spider webbing. Is it valuable? Is it like a collector stone that like only a few people know about? Kind of rare. It's more rare. That's amazing. So people don't talk about it as much. Sure, sure. It's a phosphate material. And so sometimes people like confuse it with turquoise because it, there is green turquoise. I'm going to have to look it up. I'll I'll be sure to include photos with the podcast because I, I think people are going to be really interested to see what this is, especially those of us in the trade who don't always get to interact with really unique materials. You know, if it's if it's not a gemstone that has like really strong marketing or branding behind it, uh, and people don't know what it is and they don't ask for it. It's not something we really get to work with as much. So maybe we can make Verisite like the next big thing. <laughs> yes. And that's what I've tried to do with Biden after we found it. You know, you saw it on the show, we went, we found this Biden Verisite. And so I've worked really hard. I call it my baby. So I always tell my husband, we can never, ever sell this mine because it's, Aww. you'd be like selling my baby. So I'm very like, <laughs> We never saw it in the rough. We only saw it in the cabs and very put my foot down about how that part of the business is run and works. And the rest of it, I'm like, I don't care what you guys do, but this is my baby. So please <laughs> let me run it how I want to run it. So he's kind of let me have full reign of like however I want to market the in. But I've worked really hard to get that name in our little circle out there and people wanting it and knowing what it is. What type of market is shopping for Poseidon? We saw it mostly on Instagram. We have like a specific page just for Poseidon Verisite. And then I will put some stones on our website. So we have two places that people can find it. Right now, we don't have a ton of Poseidon because we sold it all and we haven't been able to get over to that mine. That's awesome. Oh, no, we can't sell it to you. We sold it all. <laughs> it's all gone. We'll put you on the wait list, though. 
for this incredibly rare gem. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Like what an incredible company. You guys must have so much fun, you know, like getting to work with these materials in their limited. I mean, it is what it is. You have as much as you have and you sell it and then it's gone. And I feel like that makes every piece so special. My husband, Tony, always talks about how turquoise eventually will run out. And I believe it will happen in my kid's lifetime that you you just won't be able to mine turquoise anymore. That Oh, no. No, don't say that. I love turquoise. <laughs> that just means that any piece of turquoise jewelry you have is just going to continue to go up in value. Absolutely. Well, you know, turquoise has been revered for thousands of years. I mean, going back, like it's one of the most significant gemstones in history. Yes, which is really cool. And to see it come back and be just as popular as it was hundreds of years ago, you know, is really cool. And it's not just for the super wealthy or the I would consider turquoise is pretty affordable. I mean, the pieces that I've seen, I, I have seen very, very fine specimens that, you know, fetch higher prices. But for the most part, <laughs> it seems that turquoise is very, I don't know, accessible to consumers. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about the demographics of customers that you have. Who do you sell to the most and what geographic area do you think is, is the most interested in turquoise? Probably the Southwest. You know, like, if you split the United States down the middle, the West Coast is where I ship a lot to. Mm -hmm. I also get a lot of East Coast people that purchase from us. And we used to ship a lot overseas all around the world before like shipping started to get kind of crazy and they started shutting things down. And so we would ship it all around the world and it's become not just like a Native American thing. A lot of other people are building it and putting in their jewelry and making it more modern and just kind of different and accessible to everybody, like you said. I love that. I absolutely love that. It's such a beautiful stone and there's so much variety. Each piece is so unique. I do want to know, can people visit the mines? Um, we don't do tours. My father-in-law does tours. And that's at like a separate, is that a separate location? Yeah, they're a separate business. So we don't do it because it's the liability for it. And my brother-in-law lives three hours from the mine. And then we live 10 hours from the mine because we live in Arizona. And then we just travel to work there. You live 10 hours from the mine. Oh my goodness. So that's why your husband goes for a week at a time. Yeah. Holy smokes. That's quite a commute. How often do you have to go? He goes once a month. And then in the sub. Do you drive? Yeah, he drives. He always has a ton of stuff that he has to take to either fix equipment or food and supplies and stuff. So he has to drive every once in a great while. He's able to fly into Vegas and then have a shorter drive. But we always have to drive. And in the summers, we just, we have a little fifth wheel that we live in and we have four kids. So we live six people in this little 32 foot <laughs> trailer every summer. <laughs> this is amazing. You're blowing my mind right now. You're like those Instagram, TikTok people. Have you seen them who like they live in their car and they travel the country? That's what you are. You're, you're just like that. <laughs> Which I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They've kind of, I think they've grown up at first, they kind of felt like they were missing out on their summers. And then when they come back and they go to school and they, everybody be talking about what they did for the summer. And my kids are like, oh, well, we stayed at a turquoise mine and we went exploring. We did this or that. And the kids are like, what? That's amazing. They start to realize that they don't have the same kind of background as most kids these days. I mean, most kids, spend their summers, maybe going on a little vacation or just playing video games inside where we go, there is no internet, which that was super hard for them to understand, a really hard concept for them to understand, like, why is there no Wi-Fi out here? <laughs> but I think it's been good because they've been able to experience stuff that most kids won't ever experience in their lifetime most adults won't experience in their lifetime. That's something that most industry professionals would love to experience and really don't get the chance to either. I mean, this this is such a wonderful opportunity for your kids and for you and your husband as well. I mean, you guys get to see a side of the industry that the retail side 
can only really learn about from reading. I've never been, I've been to a quartz mine. I haven't been to mines really, not operating functional, real deal mines. And that's something that it's the driving force behind the industry because without mining, we don't have the product to sell. You know, we don't have the product to offer to customers who wear it and pass it down to their kids and their kids and their kids and create this incredible industry that promotes family and history and just this really unique experience with an item that you can't have with anything else. You can't, nobody wears their great, great grandmother's t-shirt. They just don't, (laughs) you know, they have their grandparents' jewelry. They have their parents' jewelry and jewelry is so meaningful. And it starts at the mine, which we don't normally get to see. So I'm, I'm so happy for you guys that you guys like really get to experience and understand this. And I love that you're sharing this information with not just the industry, but consumers as well through your TV show and giving us all kind of a peek into what that's like. And I especially love, you know, since you guys are an American family with an American mind and kind of showing where these gemstones can come from here in America. (laughs) We always think of gems as coming from far, far away lands and it's very mysterious. And, and, you know, this is, it's like shopping local. (laughs) It's like our local mine, you know, just a few states over in Nevada. And I think that's wonderful. Well, thank you. So tell me about, with that in mind, the future of the turquoise market. I know that you're using Instagram beautifully, by the way, to reach more customers and improve the brand of turquoise overall as a gemstone. Tell me where you think that's going, who you're targeting, and what kind of demand you see for turquoise in the coming years. I don't think the demand for turquoise is ever going to diminish. I think it'll always be there. And anytime you're watching TV, you can see somebody wearing turquoise, whether it be on a TV show, a commercial. Just funny because anytime we watch TV, my husband will point it out. Oh my gosh, do you see her turquoise ring? Oh my gosh, do you see her turquoise pendant or whatever you know you just start noticing more and more that it's out there and I don't think it's ever going to go away and it's there's always going to be that demand for it I think the more people that put out not necessarily modern jewelry but more like non-southwesterny looking the more people are going to be drawn to turquoise and the more educated they become by watching shows or hearing things about turquoise, and people will start to associate it with something different than just, oh, it's a stone that's always been seen in Native American jewelry. It's going to be a stone that you go, oh, I've seen that in Native American jewelry. Oh, I saw that on so-and-so, and they had this super cool modern piece, you know. So it's not going to be just one demographic. It's going to be all over the world and modernized, I guess. Oh, I love that. I love that. And I I would love to widen people's understanding of turquoise outside of just tribal jewelry. Not that, And I mean, I love tribal jewelry. I love squash blossoms. I love everything about it. But I do love turquoise outside of that too. And, you know, I deal in jade. So we study a lot of Chinese history and it's mind blowing how significant turquoise has always been to China and the cultural significance that it has over there. And so turquoise is one of those stones. You can find how it's impacted cultures and peoples on almost every single continent. And here in the States, I think a lot of customers, they just don't know that because they think of it, like you said, as as just Native American, which is still wonderful jewelry. And I know people really, really love it. And I really, really love it. But turquoise is definitely... It's more than that. It's it's a very international stone. And learning about it and seeing more of it and kind of changing your perspective, changing that image in your head when you hear the word turquoise and, and you picture a certain piece of jewelry, but being able to change that and visualize this array of opportunity for turquoise as an art in jewelry, I think will definitely impact the market and grow demand for what is such a beautiful stone. I mean, I actually, when I worked in retail, this was years ago, we had a surge of customers coming in asking for turquoise engagement rings. No joke. They had seen them on Pinterest thanks to Etsy sellers. And we got so many people wanting turquoise rings. And it was very short-lived, but it was so fun to see that demand and that interest because what a unique thing. You know, Can you imagine passing down or, or having something passed down to you, a turquoise ring 
from your parent or grandparent or aunt or whoever, it's so different from a diamond ring or, or really anything else. It's truly one of a kind, I think. It is. And especially because turquoise is always different. It can come from the same exact mine, but most likely no two stones are going to look exactly the same. Everything, it can be the exact same design, but it's still unique because the stone is unique and everything's going to be different. And one of the things I always find funny is when I have customers, I'll sell a stone and they'll message me, hey, do you have another one just like that? And I'm like, I'm sorry, but Mother Nature only created one of these and I can't, like I can get you something maybe in that same color scheme, but one that looks just like that, there's just no way. It won't be the same. So that that goes to show if you see a piece of turquoise you like, you got to buy it. <laughs> Don't wait, because if it's gone, it's gone. <laughs> yes, it's true. And I don't want my husband to know that I have like my own little hoard of stones. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm just not selling this one because it's super cool. <laughs> well, yeah, because you'll never find it again. What if you regret it? It's so they're so special. Gemstones are so special. Don't let go of them when you have them. <laughs> well, Emily, I appreciate you so much for talking to me about turquoise and your mining and just this incredible life that you and your family have. I do want to discuss how members of the trade can get in touch with you. But first, let's talk about how we'll be able to see you live and in person in Tucson in 2022. So we're going to be at the Pueblo Gem Show from, I believe it's January 28th to February 7th. And we're set up in the ballroom of the Ramada. So you guys can come down and check us out. Have all our stones there. It's actually on my, I love going down there and checking out all the different varieties that are there of all the different gemstones. And so it's kind of a cool thing that we get to do every year. The Tucson is my holiday. Like I love it more than Christmas. <laughs> I wait all year for Tucson. I cannot wait. Pueblo is my favorite show. I cannot wait to see y'all's booth and get a look at all these incredible turquoise and white buffalo pieces and Poseidon. I'm afraid I'm going to fall in love with Poseidon when I see it. <laughs> you will. I'm so excited. I cannot wait to get some. So tell everybody, if you don't mind, how they can get in touch with you, especially retailers who might be listening to this podcast who are interested in selling your turquoise in their store. How can they find you? How can they learn more? We are on Instagram on Silver State Turquoise. That's our main page. Um, we also have our website. You can reach us at silverstateturquoise.com or Audison Turquoise. It'll be on the same web page. Wonderful. So those are two main places you can find us. I love it. Well, I found you on Instagram and I love your reels. Everybody who has Instagram should definitely get on Emily's page and watch her reels and Check out all of her really informative content about turquoise. I love seeing the industry represented from a standpoint of education and knowledge and empowering the consumer with accurate information. So Emily's Instagram is definitely one you have to follow. All right. Well, guys, you can check Emily out at the Tucson Gem Show at the Pueblo Show this coming January and February. Be sure to like her on Instagram and check out her website. And hopefully we'll get some turquoise in your store and start bringing turquoise customers in. Really share the love of this incredible international stone. Emily, thanks so much. Thank you.